Um, hi, folks. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Rob Farris. I'm the research director at the Berkman Klein Center. Uh, and it is my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce and welcome our speakers today. Um, we are being live webcast, so be careful what you say. Uh, it'll be out there for posterity, and if you want to check it, this uh, talk again later, you can certainly do so. So um, uh, I'm going to read this because their resumes are so long and impressive, and I don't want to get it wrong. Um, um, Nick Coultry is the professor of media communications and social theory at the London School of Economics. Uh, he's written more books than we can mention now. They include um, Ethics of Society, A Media Society World, and Why Voice Matters. Uh, we're lucky to have him in the neighborhood this year because he's a faculty affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center, as well as a visiting researcher at Microsoft Research. Andreas Hepp is Professor of Media and Communication Studies at the Center for Media Communication and Information Research at the University of Bremen. His books include Cultures of Mediatization and Transcultural Communication. One of these days, I'm going to be able to say that word fluently, mediatization. Um, that's one of the things they're going to talk about. We're here today to learn about and celebrate the um, recent release of their book, uh, The Mediated Construction of Reality, which is uncomfortably important and salient today in the United States as it is around the world. <laughs> They're incredibly pres prescient in uh, producing that work. So I'm going to do us all a favor and let the speakers speak for themselves. Uh, we have just until 5 o'clock because they're on a shuttle to New York City. So I turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. It's great to be here. Um, yes, there are two copies of the book there and leaflets. So, you know, discount leaflets. So please take advantage of that. Um, yeah, we're really pleased to have the chance to take us through the book um, and give you a key message. And we're going to focus it towards the end. Um, I put up there the first sentence of the book. Uh, suppose the social to be mediated, what then? Those of you who are philosophers might recognize in there an echo of the first sentence of Nietzsche's greatest work, Beyond Good and Evil, which starts, suppose truth to be a woman, what then? Nietzsche was trying to say the most shocking thing in a profoundly patriarchal society, Let's leave aside the politics of whether he was right about that or not. We're trying to say something shocking here. Suppose the social to be mediated. I suppose it's to really take that reality seriously. What does that mean? And so the idea or the starting point of the book is that we have to rethink the relations between three things or on three levels. On the one hand, well, something which is quite well known from classical media sociology, uh, the relation between media and the social. Of course, this is something which is discussed for a long time, but if you look at classical social theory, it is not that well reflected. With that book, we wanted to go further, uh, also to integrate in social theory, digital media and the social, so the embeddedness of digital media in the everyday life, and even as a third step, to think about data and datafication, how the construction of the social changes when datafication becomes an important part of society. In all, we have within that book a three-step argument. In the first part, we start with constructing the social world. So it is more or less a uh, foundation of the further arguments within the book. We develop a communicative approach to the construction of the social world, reflect how mediatization developed uh, in history, and then with a figuration of perspective, we will talk later on about this. So this means how to think or rethink about social relations in times of deep mediatization. The second part of the book is focused on the different dimensions of the social world. Here especially the core argument for us is that it all goes together nowadays with data. And this is the reason why we think that many of the classical arguments about knowledge does not work anymore. And finally, we end the book with agency in the social world, so how this changes the possibility of acting on various levels. Immediate construction of reality. So what do we mean by social reality? Looking backwards to classics, some logics of historic, uh, history, um, there are always the argument that we have two points or two aspects in mind. First of all, 
the love of mediation, this is the construction of meaning, but on the other hand, the aspect of social relations that means how structure comes within society. A core argument we develop within that book, which we, which, which we start in that book, is that a process of constructing society is in all a communicative process. So it's about communication. Communication is a core for constructing the social world. But with communication, materiality plays a role, which means, first of all, that uh, we do not only have to reflect about meaning, but also the built-in environment of this materiality. And first of all, and furthermore, we have to think about how this materiality changes. And this is the point where we come to a core concept within that book. And this is the book, and this is the concept of deep mediatization. So what do we understand by deep mediatization? Deep mediatization for us is an advanced stage of mediatization in which all elements of our social world are deeply related to media and their infrastructures. And there are five points or five dimensions or five trends which are driving forces of this deep mediatization. First of all, the differentiation of media. So in the beginning, there was the idea that the digital media all would converge into some kind of super media. But what we have nowadays is a diversity of media, the Internet of Things, so rather a plurality of differentiation of media, which are, however, and this is the second trend, connected by an infrastructure, the infrastructure of the Internet, which interrelates these different kinds of media. Because of mobile communication, the third trend, these media are embedded everywhere. So there's nearly no social, a social situation anymore at least in the Western world, in which we do not have access at least to some kinds of media. But these media are, and this is the fourth thread, not so stable anymore like it has been. As these media became all software-based, we are now confronted with the situation that all these kinds of media, platforms and so on, are developed ongoingly. We are living in a situation of perpetual data. And finally, there's the trend of datafication, as these media are based on software, they are not just tools of communication anymore. They are nowadays, all the time, also tools of producing data, collecting data, and communicating data when we use these media. All of this results in what we call the media manifold, which means a complexity of media, a world or an environment of media in which these media are closely interrelated with each other. And to think about uh, social construction within this media manifold, this is the starting point of our argumentation within the book. If you look here back to classics in social theory, like for example Burke and Luckman, who wrote the book about the social construction of reality, we immediately get a feeling about the difference of the times when they were writing the book and the times we're now living in. So they still had the idea that it was direct communication, face-to-face -face communication, by which the social world is constructed. And they do not reflect media anymore, at all. So nowadays, we live in a situation where we can talk about processes of social construction without having the variety of media in mind, because nowadays, communication is not only direct communication, but it's communication which is deeply embedded in that media manifold. Social relations are, because of that, partly constructed through data and data -ification. So, just taking a step back for a moment, um, there was a classic book written in 1966, The Social Construction of Reality, believe it or not, a bestseller, um, <laughs> in the days when sociological books could be bestsellers. Um, and we're trying to echo that 50 years later in a book about the mediated construction of reality. And it was one of the few books that tries to get a view of the whole social world, see it all in one go and see how it holds together. A problem, it doesn't talk about media, because television was already very present in 1966. But nonetheless, it's worth going back to as a starting point. There's just one problem, though, that the whole classic starting point of phenomenology doesn't provide us with a secure enough foundation 
to make sense of what data actually do in the social world. And that's one I want to talk about for a few minutes because this is a deep problem we had to confront in doing the book. So we specifically identified datafication, the move to translate every particle of the social into data for further processing, as really the fourth wave of the mediatization of the world over the past two centuries. Digitization was the third wave. We're now entering a new phase, which is datafication. We're just at the beginning of that. But what does it mean? Well, it certainly potentially poses a challenge to the classic thesis of social construction of reality, which basically assumed that you could build up a picture of how the social world hangs together by listening to what each person within it says and thinks about it. Add all those together and you get a world that somehow harmonizes into a coherent social world, more or less. Institutions involved too, but basically that's it. That doesn't work for a data five world. Let me explain why. The first of all is that there's so much data being produced that human beings can't count it and collect it. It has to be done in an automated way. That means something other than human uh, beings has agency in this. That's the first problem. The second problem is that those data processes are not doing what they do for us in a way that we plan. They're acting in accordance with the goals of external actors, corporate actors, commercial actors, perfectly legitimate goals, but they are not the types of goals that single human beings can have, such as to make profit on the level of tens of billions a year. That's not a specific goal that an individual will have. It's a corporate institutional goal. It's external to what we do. And yet, this is the key thing. It's not as if all of this is irrelevant to our lives, like the way that electricity current is put together in the wires down which it's sent. Data actually contributes to the making of what we know about the social, or at least it passes for social knowledge. So we can't ignore it if we're trying to see what do we know about the social world. So we've got to think about the status of datafied readings of the social world for social knowledge if we're going to understand what the social world is in spite of all these problems which are built into what data are for phenomenology. In other words, to sum up, datafication challenges the core premise of phenomenology, at least in the traditional form. That sums up their whole book, that everyday life presents itself as a re reality interpreted by men, sorry, 1966, and subjectively meaningful to them as a coherent world. That's exactly what we all know we cannot assume now because something else, which is data, is involved in the mix, in the water, if you like. OK, that's just the start of the problems, though, because we know that data is designed to discriminate between human beings. That is the point of collecting data. And those discriminations categorize us, discriminate us between us for various purposes, commercial, others, other the issues of justice there, but they're core to what data do, the world is remade in this way through the counting and sorting. But we can't see into that process. Some of it because it is commercially sensitive, it is protected from us, the doors are barred. Some of it because it's so complex that even the inventors of Google's algorithm do not know how it plays out at every moment in time because it is machine learning. It, it cannot be unpacked into something humans can know in full detail. It's necessarily opaque. Actually, just not staying on the opacity, classical social theory thought about opacity. They had an idea that, yes, we don't know about what's going on, and we certainly don't know the future, but in the end, we know who to ask, and in the end, the future becomes the present, so we find out. So opacity isn't a deep problem in classical social theory, but it's a deep problem now, because the social world is necessarily opaque to a large degree, as the legal theorist Julie Cohen emphasized. That's increasingly important. If we can't see into way, the way this world is made, we can't intuitively understand it in the same way we used to take for granted. Also, our relations to tools have changed. Tools are always black boxes to some degree, but that doesn't matter whether you know how your car works, you still know how to drive it. However, there are different types of black boxes today. The tools we have today, the digital tools, 
A black box is in the sense that as we use them, we know they are already using us for their own purposes, which are the collection of data, as I said. So that's what we call in the book tool reversibility. Tools are meant to be things we put in our hands to achieve what we want. Now, at this very same time, they are already achieving something through us because of the fact we pick them up. That's a radical change in what a tool can be. And that changes, again, a basic assumption of classical phenomenology, which creates a new way of thinking about complexity. The world has always been complex, but it's now complex in a very different way. So the question is, what concepts can help us understand that complexity? Back to Andreas. And if you look here, social theory is special two concepts which are discussed on the one hand, the concept of the network, and on the other hand, the concept of assemblage. For sure, those concepts have their strengths, but the core argument we did a lot is that they are too weak to reflect what's going on. And this is the reason why we go back Another concept, the concept of configuration, originally developed by Norbert Elias, and try to rethink. So why that? If you look at network as a concept, this is about structural lengths. And more or less, it is not a concept which allows us also to integrate in our analysis questions of meaning, production of meaning. We remain at that level of structural lengths. If you look at the concept of other blanche, like it is, for example, discussed by Latour and others. The core thing which came into the discussion about this concept is on the one hand that we also have to reflect things and technology when it comes to the construction of social life or the social world. And the other idea is that we have to follow the actors, like it is called, so really follow from the various kind of actors, processes of constructing the social reality Integrated within that analysis also things, machines, as a certain kind of actors. Nevertheless, this concept remains weak because it is linked to an idea that the society would be flat, consisting only out of us and parts, and by that it does not become possible to integrate questions of power, power relation, and how society in total is built. If you look now at the concept of figuration, it's a different kind of thing. It is also a concept that has a certain link to the idea of network, so it is about the interrelations of different kinds of actors. But it more and more, more reflects the tensions between these different kinds of actors, the power relations between these different kinds of actors. So the idea of a figuration, like a group, for example, like a dance, for example, these are the examples now that I used is that within a figuration you always have a certain kind of power balance between these different kind of actors which are involved in that figuration. Furthermore, you already integrated network analysis with the analysis of the construction of social media. So for him, the borders or the borderlines of a figuration are always defined by the meaning of this figuration. And because of that, it is not just an abstract structural thing like networks are. Let's look at the diagram again, and just to summarize what Andrew's saying, the arrows go both ways. There's pulling. I'm pulling on you, you're pulling on me. And we're doing that because something matters about the game. It's not just a link. Something's at stake. Something has to be got right. Something means something. This is a dynamic way of thinking about complexity. And the amazing discovery we made there we're adding in, it's not just between us, because of course we're also being pulled by social forces. And Elias had the idea, not only are we pulling on each other, but each of us is being pulled laterally by society. So there's a very complex play of forces. And here's the amazing discovery we made in writing the book. That Norbert Elias had conceptualized this at least 10 years ahead of Latour, Actually, it's more amazing than that. He had the concept of the figuration in the 1930s when he was in exile from Germany. It's in the civilizing process. In other words, he was about 40, if not 50 years ahead of what we think is the most advanced thinking about social complexity today. And that is sobering. Let me take you through how amazing his idea is. It's a model of processes of interweaving within networks. He stresses the networks like a game of cards, but that's only the most simple example. 
Um, social interweaving with that special kind of order, Latour could have written this, that starts from the connections, the relationships, and works out from there to the elements. The elements are produced out of the connections, just what Latour said. Um, and the key thing, the behavior of many people intermeshes to form interwoven structures. I think that metaphor is really important because when something meshes, it's not just linked, there's a pulling which gives the strength to the lattice work. He actually uses the concept of lattice work from chemistry. This is a very dynamic way of thinking about complexity. It's not an engineering model, well, that's dynamic too. I think it's operating in higher dimensions. Let me just bring that out because it's clearly not just to think about particular card games to understand contemporary society. We have to move from there to complexity. So in the book, we developed the concept of figurations of figurations, higher dimensional figurations, all of them pulling on each other to produce higher dimensional tensions that intersect in our bodies and we have to live. Here's a diagram that explains that. So there's the simple figuration, but something's pulling it from outside. Another figuration. And another figuration. Each of them being pulled, there could be a hundred, a thousand dimensions. Society is made out of many, many dimensions, and the tensions are at the higher dimensions. It's no good just looking at one dimension to see the complexity. And that's, I think, familiar because it, thinks, it helps us think about the, as it were, wicked or insoluble problems we're now facing. But Elias had already grasped this with a little addition from us. So what does this mean for social order? Well, the first thing we say in the book to get the handle on this difficult concept of figurations of figurations, i.e. higher dimensional tensions, is that Facebook is a clear example of this. Facebook is both an infrastructure and it's a site of many levels of meaning making. It's both together, not one or the other. And it's being pulled and it's pulling in multiple directions. And it gets into a lot of problems, as we'll come to at the end of the talk. So the question is, what does a social order look like then if it's built out of many entities that have this sort of property, as we know now today it is? Well, one very striking thing about the platform, the digital platform, is that it's a space where we almost can't draw a line anymore between the social and the economic. Of course, the economic has always been a little social and vice versa. But now, when we are acting socially, hanging out with our friends, we are in the economy. That is a radical shift in social space and economic space. And it's part of increasing interdependence, which is creating, for good or ill, new types, radical new types of tension. Let's take the case of the law. The law itself is a complex figuration emerging from many, many competing parties pulling on each other. But of course, there are new parties. Platforms far beyond the state are doing, whether they want to or not, the work of regulating their content. They may not want to do this, but this is de facto what they're doing. And they're being pulled on as they do this. This creates a massive complexity because law is, has to try and be the attempt to regulate the whole social order that amounts from all of this. But how is it going to do it? How is it possible even to conceive of this problem? Well, again, this is the problem that Facebook faces. And we had the global policy director of Facebook here two or three weeks ago, and I was struck by her answers, which offered credible procedures for trying to decide certain things, if you like, in management terms. Perfectly reasonable. But the real problem that Facebook faces is where does it get its authority from? How can we imagine an institution that has a constituency bigger than even China, two billion people now on Facebook, that has the authority to make legitimate decisions about the way the public world could be? No government can yet do that. Why should we imagine that Facebook can? Are we clear about the size of the problem, in other words, unless we start to see it from a social theoretical point of view? This is not a technological or legal problem. It is a profound problem about what social order can be. So we want to leave with three questions and then have some discussion. All of this leads in the last two chapters of the book, focus on this once you get beyond the details of the concepts that get us to this point. So some really urgent questions for thinking about the types of social societies or let's say, social orders, because they go beyond national boundaries for sure, that we're living. How can governance 
either regulation for good human ends of this social law, how can it be effective anymore? Where does the effectiveness come from? What resources can it draw on? Does it have the resources? Even if it's effective, it still needs in the long run to be legitimate because I can hit you over the head and that's very effective in the short term, but it's certainly not legitimate and you will hit me back and that's unstable. Effective governance has to also be legitimate. But where does the legitimacy come from on the scale on which our platforms are now operating? I genuinely don't think we know the answer to that question. And it's a question that only starts to become clear when we put all this in social theoretical terms and to think about the social relations we're talking about, not just the mechanisms. And that raises the third question, how can society, in the general sense, any human society, the social order we're trying to live now, can it be governable? What are the consequences if it is no longer governable? How is that compatible with democracy, order, I mean order not in the sense of closing things down, but a basic order which we can live while remaining sane. Those are the questions we think that social theory forces us to ask, and we don't have the answers, but we hope they're interesting questions. So thank you for listening. We look forward to your questions. Maybe we should go and sit on these wonderful chairs. <laughs> We do have a couple of mics floating around just in case. Uh, we just want to make sure we get your questions on the webcast. Can, can I ask a question that uh, I, I'm not going to attempt to answer those. Those are really powerful, important questions. I, I hope we'll come back to those. But I, I was struck at the confluence of datafication and reality in your talk. And I realized that intuitively I would have thought that more information, more data would more firmly root us in reality or at least a shared reality of some sort. And we seem to be in interesting ways moving in the other direction. Is that consistent with what you would have expected or what your travels have, have led you to believe? Is there, is it, does, does it make sense? Well, you could be right in the long run about the direction of travel. Um, if these gaps we're seeing, these fissures, if you like, in the, the world that's offered to us through data gets, get filled in. We start to trust all sources of data. We start to understand better how it's generated. We understand how Facebook's algorithms work validly to present us with the news feeds and other things they present us to, and we have fully understand. If those things can be filled in, patched up, you could be right. But at the moment, these are big cracks, and they're cracks linked to the very different way that the information is now sourced. I mean, Berger and Luckman had the idea, which wasn't sentimental, it was quite hard-headed, that however complex institutions are, in the end they're made out of human beings, broadly according to rules we roughly understand, even when we don't like them, and we can somehow intuit, okay, that's how the government somehow reached a decision like that or that's how my school rejected my child, and so on and so forth. And on that basis, we trust those institutions. It's pretty obvious we're in a situation where trust in data platforms is at least uncertain at the moment. It's being worked on, earned, uncertain. And the reasons are not because these are bad institutions or bad people. They're linked to the fundamental nature of what they have to do, which is to deliver legitimacy for something that goes far beyond what human beings are doing. It has to be automated. This is a really big problem that Berger and Luckman could never imagine. So you may be right in the long run, we may solve all this. Right now, we're not solving it. Maybe so. take an example. Think about the stock market nowadays. Large parts of the stock market are based really on software. Negotiations which take place are not human actors anymore who do it. It's a software program. So you, create, you get a completely different point of view of the social is constructed. It's not just by the humans, it is a delegation to technology. Without the delegation, humans cannot overview anything. And then you end with another perspective on regulation. This kind of market has completely different kinds of dimension you have to regulate to govern. Then, for example, stock markets like you have um, like Bergen Luckman imagines, still a market where people, human beings, come together and negotiate. 
And if you look at the financial crisis, partly this is also driven by datafication. Because of this really deep transformation of the stock market. I have a question about uh, the slide going back to hidden social discrimination. Um, so there were two, two lines that you had summarized, one being that the world now um, being remade through counting and sorting, yeah. and another which is that um, algorithms are necessarily opaque. And necessary partly opaque. Partly. Okay, yeah. so um, I, I'm, I'm thinking back on, for example, early efforts of cart cartography where the world is actually made more legible through yeah. measurement, through procedural abstraction. Um, and perhaps, I think algorithms are not, opacity is not a property of algorithms themselves, right? But incentives, they're incentives to keep them opaque. And so I, my question is from your, from the social perspective, um, how, how can we organize societal pressures to push for more transparency, for more equity? And can this be accomplished through market incentives or what other incentives regulations um, can, can actually make a difference and have agency? Um, well, I, I'd step back one point. I think there's one reason why we said that algorithmically produced knowledge is necessarily partly opaque, um, which is because of machine learning, there's an element of complexity which is nonlinear, which can't fully be unpacked as it's occurring. We might know what generates it in broad terms, but it cannot be un unpacked even by the engineers themselves. Right? So that's, that's always going to be a problem. Maybe we can find ways of living with that and tell stories to ourselves that allows that uh, to work. The commercial force is massive because I think it's very interesting to do a historical comparison. I've been doing this in the past month or two while I've been here. 19th century, you had a parallel explosion in social knowledge. The birth of statistics, the discovery there were means and averages. There was an average man who behaved with this astonishing regularity. Um, this transformed what policy could be. It led to new concepts of poverty and so on. It led to an extraordinary revolution. But as I was reading that history, and that's where the quote about making the world comes from, from Ted Porter's book, that was primarily a public infrastructure of knowledge. The criteria were pretty clear and out in the open. They were intensely debated. Even Dickens in his novels made fun of it. It was out there, and it was debated. We now know that's not the type of public space we're in at the moment. Maybe we can imagine a greater shift with an increase in literacy so that we start debating those issues. But think about the issues around blockchain or something like that. The structure itself is so complex that only a small number of people fully understand it. It is not something that's straightforwardly translatable. In other words, put it at its crudest, because of these greater interdependencies, we're reaching a level where the complexity that underpins the infrastructure on which we rely just to live our lives is so complex we cannot fully see into it because of the complexity, however hard we try. And I think that makes it a different type of world. It's from the ones with classical social theory assumed that you could, there's always an element of opacity, but it was solvable. What if it's not a solvable anymore? That changes the basis on which we can trust that world which in the end tests its stability and less force is <laughs> applied to, which is not what we want to talk about. We want to talk about democratic solutions to these problems. You could be right, but I don't see much progress at the moment. Um, you may be more optimistic. You may can see more light. Uh, I think there was a question at the back. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's sort of a question towards method. So I'm, I'm quite struck with um, what's it like to develop social theories on these issues as they are evolving? Um, what both are perhaps the biggest challenges, including in communicating them to people to get understanding, to sort of, you know, like have the, have the relationship, especially to topics that are so politically, politically and politically discussed. Um, so what's both challenging and also rewarding about that? Do you want to start? Because you... Okay, well, I... Um, Andrus is being modest. He's actually doing some very imp interesting empirical work on some of these things on the ground, the quantified self. You might want to 
Good. Uh, I'll start, if you like, because theory, I love doing theory. I, I do enjoy doing it. I feel a new urgency in doing it when I am not understanding the configuration of things around me, and I feel we're struggling to get a sense of it. That's what theory, theory has to be useful. It has no value in itself unless it gives us tools in our hands. So we had to work on those tools through constant debate. But we draw on a lot of secondary literature and try and distill the lessons from that. And that's where the empirical comes into this. Well, for us, especially for me, many of the main parts of the books are based on empirical research. And so, for example, what we did is comparing different media generations, uh, how their community building changed, and how recently pioneer communities, one defined self maker movement, and so on. Again, from the point of view, how they're involved in processes of change in the social construction. And if you have this point of view in research, or this perspective in research, you, you are confronted with the question which integrating concept might you use? to compare really very different fields of society. And then looking at a general discussion, you end, first of all, either by network or some language. And in empirical research, of course we did network analysis, yes. And of course the idea to integrate technology in the analysis and follow the actor and so on and so on, like it is done in AMT or in other large concept, is a help. But as an integrative concept to compare so different things like community building in the everyday life, the pioneer communities, already there, it falls short. Uh, and this is the reason why we ended, because of this empirical research, with a figurational approach. So for us, it was a practical help to integrate um, various kinds of network analysis with other forms of analysis which are more based on established qualitative methods, so observation, for example, or uh, qualitative independence. It is an integrative concept which fits from our point of view very well the different kinds of empirical analysis. And we had a creative research unit on that which really tried uh, this approach, this figurational approach, um, to compare very, very different domains of society and how they change with media, digital media identification. Things like, for example, school. Um, journalism, organizations of journalism, or, for example, communities. All of them you can understand in a certain way as figurations with these kind of tensions. And you can reflect or do an analysis how these different kinds of tensions change when certain kind of new media are involved in that. And always it's not only one kind of media, it's a variety of media. Right? And by this you have a tool to compare very different um, social domains and how they change with mediatization and demediatization. So in core, or in essence, um, this figurational approach is, for me, especially an analytical approach to do empirical research on various social domains and compare how these social domains transform, change with the latest media-related changes. Um, I had a question about your questions. Um, the term governance seems to preempt the the object because you it, if we in general I think it, certainly the usage I'm acquainted with the governance points away from states as the origins of regulatory frameworks and towards mixed frameworks like let's say, um, since where we are, internet governance, which involves a huge variety of disparate bodies from corporations to expert bodies to international groups and nation state actors. Have you preempted the answer to your question by effectively saying the state isn't going to be the central? No, not at all. Well, actually, I don't like the word governance. I uh, feel a compulsion to use it because it has become so now I completely share your critique of the word I don't like it because if we give up on the idea of the state the only so far successfully rep uh, means of representing a large number of wills <laughs> has something to say then we're in trouble so I couldn't agree more we used it for convenience um, could have put it in scare quotes if you like but there's no doubt and Julie Cohen's work is particularly strong here from the Georgetown Law School, that 
and I've been doing separate work with her, was, is that, like it or not, the regulation for the public good of this world we call a public domain, which we want to be good rather than bad, is increasingly being done by institutions which are driven by their own perfectly valid local, as it were, commercial ends. Um, not by entities that in any sense need or claim to represent a public wider interest. We've operated with that market for a while. You mentioned the market, and of course that's a very important philosophical position to say the market must be able to provide that. I think at this scale it's extremely difficult, and we're seeing that tension around uh, entities like Facebook. To give you an example of the Facebook uh, manifesto published on 16, I think it was the 16th of February this year by Mark Zuckerberg, which I'm sure everyone's read. If you read that, addressed to the global community, virtually every sentence is ambiguous because he's having to face two audiences at the same time. He's having to say, you are the real human beings who are independently choosing to use Facebook. You're independent. And I'm, and you are our community. I've, I've studied it closely. He keeps sliding between the community, which must be real beyond Facebook, and our community. And this is a serious problem that I, so I have some sympathy that they are in this bind and it goes to these social theoretical roots. We don't know how an organization that should be. And yet we criticize it, we're angry with it, because we haven't modeled it, we haven't thought the complexity through to that level. So, yes, you're right. Thanks for drawing me into that. Governance is precisely slippery and difficult here, and we've got to get a grip on it. Maybe really, add, we can have a gun there, the figuration perspective as an analytical mm -hmm. tool. So, when it comes to regulation, this perspective is helpful in double sense. First of all, we can think about um, the agencies of regulation as a certain kind of figuration, and that changed a lot. Uh, it is not just the state anymore when it comes to internet governance, for example. We have a completely new kind of figuration of figuration of figurations. And at the same time, as the other level, the problem is how to regulate this complexity of figurations. And again, it is not something you can think anymore in the borders of a state, if you talk about Facebook, for example. And so thinking in this figuration perspective allows us to have an analytical tool to grasp what changes with or within regulation. Yeah? So it is for us, on the one hand, is this normative aspect it was talking about. On the other hand, it's really this analytical aspect to think about how regulation changed. And when it comes to internet governance, or regulation of the internet, the interesting thing is that partly these new forms of regulation, these new figurations of regulation, only work because they are also mediated in a certain way. So within them, media and technologies play a role. Yeah? So this is the double complexity you have when it comes to internet or the internet governance, which is completely different if you compare it with problems of governance or regulation, let's say 50, 60 years ago, when classical social theory thought about these problems. So I have a question um, about where the individual fits into this framework, right? So we, with deep mediatization, we have a stronger and stronger centralization of information, of data, states, um, corporations, platforms like the Facebook, Twitters. Um, where does individual fit? And is solely as a consumer of data, um, source for data, neither uh, a sheep in the, in the pack? I'm just curious. Maybe again start with something analytical. So if you take this perspective, the individual is never thought as isolated. It is always in the crossing of various figurations. And these figurations are nowadays also figurations which are mediated. So the individual is always part of social groups within Facebook on other kinds of social media. And how he or she is constructed itself as a person, as an individual has a lot to do with the tensions of the different kinds of figuration he or she is involved in. And by this, it means that you never can think about, like, for example, datafication or um, commercialization as something which is outside in you. Always from the beginning, the construction of the individual relates to processes like that. And so the idea is um, 
of that kind of perspective, not separate the individual from society, but see from the beginning that the individual is, in, is always, as he or she is embedded in, uh, in certain figurations, part of society, and the society as such, as this complexity of figurations, not, never ever beyond these, or beyond individuals. So it's a kind of thinking which starts fundamentally uh, from the argument that you cannot separate society from the individual. You have always analyzed both together. Okay, think, and that, that's the answer that Elias has. It's a very rich one. But I think you've also asked a moral question in, 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 in effect. We could have the most complex theoretical vocabulary, but if it's losing touch with the realities of everyday experience, something is dislocated. And actually, Elias said that in one of his books. He said that we can analyze as much as we want these figurations, but if we don't understand that in the end what matters is what happens to human beings in the figurations. And this is why that diagram was so important, because whatever the brilliance of Latour and other writers to tell us about linkages and non-human objects, in the end, when we have a serious conversation about the lies and whether it's good or not, it's the human objects we care about and whether their lies will have been good in the end. And that comes down not just to how they're linked, but the meaning of those links and so on. And these pushing them. So the individual is absolutely in there, struggling, pulling, being pulled. And that's, I think, how we start to get a sense of how deep these contradictions are. We could have talked about time as well. Turns out that Elias use this theory to explain time pressure through system pullings that happen to be intersected with the person who has to be at the airport at 7 o'clock to get our plane at 7 o'clock. And you feel this absolute tension. But So we're caught in this. So it's both and. But it's really important to ask that question. Where is the individual in this? A lot of social theory has lost that moral ground in the past 20 years, in my view. So I'm glad you asked it. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question. Awesome. Or maybe two quick ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, Take them together, and then we can try and ask them together. OK, great. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to backtrack, because I think there's a lot to pick up on with the discussion just started about the role of the individual. But I wanted to go back to the question of, of governance, because that was one of two of your, your main kind of concluding questions around the effectiveness and legitimacy. And I, and I take on board, and I don't want to like be the defender of, of, of the framework of governance, but um, I think that a lot of the, your response to that question kind of presumed a level of functionality and, dare we say, like democratic, you know, and, and functioning governments in, the, in this to, to play that role of regulators or as, uh, you know, as entities that are playing, a, that are having something to say about regulation. And I think that one of the appealing things around governance and one of the things that was supposed to, right, be something that was positive in this power dynamic shift is when it comes to authoritarian countries or even liberal democracies like Britain, France, the UK that are struggling with some authoritarian-like policies, especially when it comes to pressure on um, social media companies in particular, that changes how we, how we look at, at this a little bit. And so I will, I'll stop there and just say, I'd like to ask for you to say a little bit more about that yeah. in one sense. I'm also not trying to come across as defense of no, the companies in this space, because I think they're, when we look at governments and corporations, we have to look critically at both, but at the same time, I think one of the big pieces is the kind of collusion, collaboration, and the relationship between those two, and how do we, how do we approach it from that perspective? Electra, can you ask a quick question? So it'd be good to hear. See if we can. Actually, I think it was quite related. Um, I, my question was, um, I'm intrigued by what you say about um, companies that act for their own purposes and not the purposes of the community. Um, and not, not that I disagree, but I'm also I'm interested in the sort of rhetoric that you were mentioning about Facebook saying our community and trying to actually reflect the interests of the community. And I think it plays into the question yeah. on governance. So have you thought about whether a community such as the Facebook community could become a sort of 
um, form of uh, self-organization? I don't know. Yeah, well, these are great questions. So let me go back to the question, what is it to do social theory? Uh, what is it to a try? We're trying to develop a general model of the minimal level of complexity of the problems we're dealing with today, basically. Now, you're adding, quite rightly, the additional levels of complexity, which is a lot of governments don't work, a lot of institutions don't have the resources, and so on and so forth. Some, on the other hand, can fight back and can, great. But what we're trying to get at, the, the social problems we face today are at least this complex. And if they're at least this complex, then we know we don't have any off-the-shelf solutions to problems this complex. We've got to think at that level of complexity to understand there, there are these sort of tensions of order built in to the very baseline from which we're starting today. That doesn't mean to say that things aren't a lot more difficult. And we don't, we try to abstract from the political debates around Trump and all the things and everything, collapse of government in Britain, you name it. Because those are the additional level of problems. But they're linked to these baseline problems that we don't know where trust in government is coming from anymore. We don't know how governments can function at this level of pressure to deal with the speed and so on. We could go on and on. And I think we need to get that baseline clear, which is in no way to neglect the importance of the specifics. Uh, but hopefully, theory like this gives us a starting point to thinking where do we start to get into the empirical cases, which you know Andrews does in his own work a lot, and I do in other work. So uh, I think we'll but coming to the end where our own time complexities will force us to get the taxi we've carefully arranged. But thank you for coming and for your questions. And thank you to the online audience and the people watching at some later point in time. Thank you so much for joining us today. You've left us really a lot to chew on. I wish we could continue the conversation right now, but not at the cost of you missing your flight. But this is a really important material for us in the community to chew on. And we will continue the conversation online as we see each other in person. So, uh, please join me in thanking Professor.